respected uh, Dr. Dia Mehta, Professor Anil Gupta, and friends. Well, let me extend a very warm welcome to you all. Uh, this is our second uh, national seminar on social innovation. Six organizations have come together to organize this. This uh, design of uh, today's uh, uh, program has a very strong imprint uh, from uh, Professor Anil Gupta. I call him a national mentor for this uh, uh, social uh, innovation uh, seminar and the rest of the activities. And if you remember, last year we had uh, divided the entire uh, uh, session into um, uh, entire seminar into uh, four subgroups. Uh, they were Sahajta, Samvedana, Saralta, and Sampration, four, right? This year, you will find six, not four, but six. And what are those? They are Samvedana, Sahajta, Saralta, Sahayog, Swachatha, and Sampration. The Sahayog part of it comes out as a result of the deliberations we had last time, because everybody said that we must have Sahayog, so we have had a special session uh, on that. And Swachatha actually comes from this national call that our uh, Prime Minister gave from Red Fort on Swach Bharat. So I'll be sitting there learning throughout the day, and I hope that uh, uh, we'll have uh, uh, as enjoyable session as we had last time, and we'll learn more, but more importantly, will do more. Distinguished Chairman, Dr. Machelkar, another iconic figure, Dr. Gupta, distinguished guests, and representatives of various NGOs. It's my privilege to be associated with an organization called Bhagwan Mahavir Viklang Sahita Samiti. I'll just give a small presentation, three minutes, and then I'll make some comments, related comments. The building it's a <coughs> non-sectarian, non-political, international NGO. Objective is to provide mobility and dignity. These are different products. This is Jaipur Fort, Jaipur Biloni Limb, Abauni Limb. The new joint I'll be talking of is, Dr. Mashilkar said, 1.4 million beneficiaries, starting with 60 and now over 60,000. Now, this is the functionality. And uh, you'll see the actual thing. Just see this. He walks in, he gets the limb maybe the same or the second day. Normally the time taken in most of the organization in the world is between three weeks to three months. We take about one to three days. Technology is different. Climbs a tree. That's the beauty of Jaipur limb. Skating, just imagine. Sudha Chandran, famous dancer, wears Jaipur foot. Total cost of foot piece alone is about $10. Total cost of the limb presently is $50. That's our cost, not with the patient I'm repeating. Another point is, if you're giving something to the needy, poor, 95% of our people are below the poverty line. Our philosophy is that if you are giving something to such people, give them a better product, not inferior product. Just because you are giving it free, we give it totally free. Otherwise, the poor would never ever get the limbs which is their basic necessity in life. So we, we said that how do you ensure better quality? I think one point social sector is missing is unless you interlink with science and technology, you would stagnate. And you would not be in a position to give the proper kind of equipment or device you want to give. This is Jaipur knee for a bony patient, knee joint, is a very serious problem for all the patients all over the world. Now they developed it and they call it with us, working with us, it's a MOU. And they said that the Time Magazine USA described this as one of the 50 best inventions of the world for the year 2009. This, this is our um, uh, pat phrase, BMBS has married service with science. Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq, Vietnam, Sri Lanka, Sudan, name any country which is the most dangerous one, and you will find the prints of Jabal Fook there. Then another point is, and that's what I've learned, both from my <coughs> experience 
<coughs> in the public system and also now in the social sector that you must have some corpus when you start a society. Otherwise, you get maybe support. But support comes in March. What do you do? If you get close, to restart is very difficult. You lose credibility. So you must have, I mean, it's a point of financial wisdom. When you start the system, you must have some. We started with four lakhs corpus. And over time, it went up. So work is never closed. So I, submission I have to make is that these are some of the features. There could be several others uh, which, which I think will help uh, social organization get established, established well, grow, and be successful and serve the humanity on a much larger scale. Thank you very much. Happy to be here with all of you for this uh, wonderful workshop. We'll start with uh, Mr. Pradeep Sharma, who's the founder of the uh, Rickshaw Bank in Gauhati, to talk about his work. This is 10 million rickshaw pullers in the country. That most sus means vulnerable people, no access to any formal institutions or any financial institutions. 95% they always hire a rickshaw. Most of them are from the below poverty line and almost half are illiterate. So that way, on an average, they have the five dependents in each family. These are three uh, different challenges. One is social challenges, financial challenges, and technical challenges. I'm referring here all, all the rickshaw pullers community in the country. Under social, uh, it's basically recognition because nobody really recognized their services in the country. And the big challenge for the rickshaw pullers is the identity crisis because they are migrating from one place to other place. Licensing is a major challenge. And also most of the cities, sometimes they seized and then finally disposed of. And every time the blame goes to rickshaw pullers, particularly on the traffic issues. Same way on the technical part, you can't believe me that in the country, although we have the 10 million rickshaw pullers, but we don't have like a branded rickshaw company here. All are the different part manufacturer. There are no such like a branded rickshaw in the country. Coming to the financial part, as I have mentioned, that most of them are the migrant people. So that's, they are the big challenges and the finance, no financial institute has supported the rickshaw pullers. There was no insurance coverage for the rickshaw pullers and no other social security. In the country, 250 million kilometers transport services is contributed by these rickshaw pullers to the nation. And thereby, they are basically saving 20 million liters of fossil fuels. So if this is the scenario, but what best we are doing for those rickshaw pullers? So we have come out with this new design of rickshaw, which is more lighter, it's aerodynamically designed, more spacious, and it's well covered for both rickshaw puller as well as the passengers. This is, as I have mentioned, that the same thing they are practicing. They are paying, say, 30 or 50 rupees every day as a rent. So what we have done, we have just delivered a total package of rickshaw, insurance, license, uniform, and the ID card. And we ask them to pay the exactly same amount that they are paying on a rent. And in maximum 15 months time, the whole money comes back. So we just transfer the ownership to them. So now we are not restricted only with rickshaw. We have seen that there may be a lot of innovation we can do. So we have come out with different card design. With this word, thank you. Thank you once again for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. I think for the next presentation, I call upon Mr. Ekalvaya Prasad, Managing Trustee of Make Bayane Abhiyan Sikhihar, to make his presentation. Uh, I represent an organi organization which, which is called Make Bayane Abhiyan. We work primarily in North Bihar, in the flood prone areas of North Bihar. Uh, largely in the Mithila region. And this name basically means Meg is cloud, pine in Mithila is water. 
and Abhyan is campaign. Uh, we've been working in North Bihar uh, since almost about 2006. And we are working on an issue which is basically scarcity in abundance. Uh, despite being considered as the, m the most flood prone areas in North Bihar, and in, in, in the country, there is a huge problem as regards drinking water is concerned. And this I got to know, I'm from Bihar. So when I looked at that point, that area, it was shocking and uh, I couldn't understand as to how we can have problem in an area which has so much of water. And primarily this became the reason for people not addressing or rather not looking at this problem. So during floods, the basic so source that you are dependent on stops providing you water. So we started out, the first innovation that we did was of harvesting rain. So we, there were two types of innovations in the entire approach of rainwater harvesting. One was of harvesting, basically, of using the temporary catchment. And the second one was what we call as jalkoti. And over the years, we do see that people have started adopting rainwater harvesting on their own, uh, primarily during floods. The second thing which we realized was ex excessive contamination of groundwater. Now for us, it was important to look at how we can actually use the local skill sets, the local knowledge and try to come up with uh, an alternative practice. And that's exactly what we did. We spent almost about a year looking for indicators of people's own understanding. The culture for us is basically not to go with this whole mindset that we know it all, but with the whole mindset of let's explore and believe you me, whatever alternatives M Make Pine Abhyan is talking about today, it has all come out from the community rather than we, we do not have any stake in that. So uh, we have three types of, uh, three uh, typologies of um, um, filters, one which takes care of arsenic, the other uh, uh, arsenic and, uh, and uh, iron, and the third is bacteria and iron. So, and all of this, as I said earlier, are, are being produced locally. And the third innovation that we did was in terms of looking and promoting dug wells, open dug wells, with a scientific and a local uh, argument as to why dug wells are good for the alluvial floodplains. As a net result today, uh, Meghpain Abhyan has been working with others, other uh, resource organizations across the country in trying to look at how such problems of drinking water and sanitation in, in, in a place like North Bihar can be further decentralized and solutions can be put across or alternatives can be put across to people saying that this is how we need to move ahead. Thank you. Now we do have uh, Dr. R.D. Ravindran, the chairman of Arvind Eye Care uh, System and probably they, have the, they are the example of affordable excellence. So we listen from uh, Mr. Ravindran about their wonderful work. I mean, as we all know, blindness is a, it's a big problem. The visual disability, once somebody gets it, you know, bo being born blind is different. But you know, you, bo you are born with a normal vision. By 40 years or 50 years, mm -hmm. you lose mm -hmm. your vision. Then you know, with that, you lose your dignity, your social status, your economical independence. However, the challenges, I mean, most of these blind people are in the rural areas. They are illiterate. They are women. I think it is about 50 to 60 percent higher in the rural areas and among those who are illiterate, at, at least about 35 to 40 percent higher in the women. And these people have several challenges and which, for which you know, we need to, and which is kind of a barrier for them to access the eye care. As a result, today we have close to about 70 to 80 percent of the people. So the, even though we have everything provided free, it's a state-of-the-art facility, creating the access becomes very, very important. And also making it affordable and ensuring quality in such a, uh, a large volume and also in a resource uh, uh, scarcity setup, you know, environment, how do we do it? It's just a challenge. So this is one of the eye camp. We always involve the community. None of we conducted each year about 2,500 or 3,000 eye camps. And all of these camps are run only by the community. We don't spend any money for conducting these camps. So all these, you know, when it happens, we are able to break that barrier and we are able to improve the access for the patient. 
So, but at the same time, whether it is very effective, because you know, any organization, any innovation have to be evolving. When we looked at these camps, how effective they are, we found that only 7% of the people who need eye care in that particular rural area are using it. So we went for a different model, which is about having a vision center in the villages. It was connected with the base hospital. Five of the centers are manned by one doctor in the base hospital. Making it affordable to the patient is also very important. And also to the provider, you know, when you have a very limited resources. So this is, again, it's very important. Even any, any kind of intervention you have, we need to complete all the investigation. These are some of the things we have put on upon ourselves. We eliminate unnecessary tests. We make sure that you know, the medication we prescribe to the patients is very, uh, very nominal cost. Otherwise, you know, even though you may do everything free for the patient, it may not coming several times to the hospital or giving expensive medications all become very expensive. If we want to improve the productivity of the doctor, we have to make sure that some of that work, which are skill-based work, are, are done by the nurses. And we take close to about 400 to 500 villages, especially from the rural areas. The people uh, uh, have a lot of values which may not be able to have it in a, in a group from the urban area. They perform all this work, really good quality, which make our doctors become very, very productive. And uh, at the same time, whatever we do, there are several things we do, several best practices. We alone won't be able to eliminate the needless blindness in this world, in this country or in this community. So we work with several hospitals and close to about 250 eye hospitals in India and about uh, another 60, 70 hospitals. Today we work with 310 eye hospitals across uh, India and other parts of the world. And again, you know, and it all comes down to the values of the leadership. I mean, one is uh, the, the senior leadership believing personally in the empathy, compassion and love and being sensitive to the community. But at the same time, how do you bring these values into the system? Once it, you bring it into the, making the system, you may have the values, but the system may be very insensitive. But you know, making sure that the system is also sensitive to the needs of the, the community is very, very important. That's where the leadership role is very important. And you know, unless we have the, we bring in that, the fourth dimension, the spiritual aspect into, into each and every employee, we may not be able to really succeed. Thank you.